Welcome to Legends in Leadership, brought to you by ISF and the Carrington Group. Legends in Leadership is an inspirational podcast featuring the stories of leaders who are making a difference. Our goal is to inspire you with the stories of leaders who come from humble beginnings, overcome challenges, and ultimately rise up to make a difference in people's lives. Hello, folks. This is Dr. Blair Ritchie, and I am the executive director of ISF. And uh, with me today are my co-hosts, Tyler Tallman and Jason Smith, who are family officers with the Carrington Group. I want to welcome everybody to our initial podcast of Legends in Leadership. And uh, one of the fun things we want to do every time we're together is a little leadership trivia. So uh, we just have this fascination with leadership stories, people who, like us, come from humble beginnings and then rise up to be leaders and make a, making a difference in their, uh, in their community. So Tyler, you're going to do the segment for us today. So let me turn it back over to you. And what's our leadership uh, trivia question for the day? You bet. So uh, we were talking a little bit pre-show about how excited that uh, we are that football season's right around the corner. Uh, Got a couple of uh, horned frogs sitting next to each other, so we're excited for college football and TCU. Uh, We've we've got a Steelers fan and Dr. Blair at the end of the table, and uh, of course uh, uh, Richard uh, with us, uh, Cowboys fan. So uh, we thought it would only be fitting that we uh, would feature uh, something to do with football. So we decided uh, to look at and feature one of the most dynamic uh, defensive uh, players in the NFL. Uh, This particular person, uh, by the way, uh, coming out of high school, a one-star recruit, uh, barely made it uh, at a small university in Michigan as a tight end. Uh, he uh, did all the things that you have to do uh, to be successful uh, when you don't have a lot of money. So he survived as a pizza boy uh, delivering pizzas. Uh, but his leadership uh, lifted an entire community of people uh, when their city was almost blown away and flooded. Um, do you know who today's leadership legend is? And uh, when we get to, to the end of the broadcast, we'll talk a little bit about that. So send it back over to you, Blair. Thanks, Tyler. Looking yeah. forward to the answer to that one. That, that's, that's a good one. I'm sure it's a Steeler, uh, but maybe not. Oh, come on, come <laughs> on. Right, come on. Yeah. Well, we're excited today to welcome our uh, guest uh, in our Le- Legends and Leadership uh, podcast today. Uh, you know, when you live in Dallas, you don't get to kind of brag about the the beaches or the mountains, but we have such a vibrant business community with some great, incredible leaders. And the one thing about Dallas is we eat very, very well. And the restaurant community here in Dallas is one of the most vibrant. And today, it's our joy to have one of the, I have legends in in the leaders of of the restaurant community. Uh, 25 years ago, I understand, Richard Chamberlain opened uh, Chamberlain's Steak and Chop House. Congratulations on the 25th anniversary of that. And uh, since then, he's actually opened the uh, Fish Market Grill as well. And uh, Richard, thank you for being a guest. And we're just delighted to have you today. My pleasure. It's uh, really an honor to be here. Well, one of the things that we love to explore on this podcast is uh, how people get to be where they are today, because we don't believe that legends are born or even leaders are born. We may may be born with some leadership capacities that differ from each other, but the reality is it's a journey, and uh, we all get to where we are, and we all become what we become, and uh, we're always fascinated to ask the question how you how you got to be you and so let's go back on your journey and some of the things that formed you on, along the way uh, with regards to the, the leadership journey you've been on well sure uh, I'll just give you a quick overview on how I got into cooking because you know I'm a chef by trade uh, restaurant tour really having learned that along the way I, uh, I took a home ec class in high school to meet a girl I had a crush on <laughs> it's a true story and, uh, and I ended up loving the cooking part of it. So uh, on graduation, my mother really encouraged me to go into culinary school. Uh, and that, that really enabled me to uh, get on at the mansion on Turtle Creek when it first opened uh, back in 1980. And uh, Dean Faring was the uh, saucier at the time. He had moved down from uh, having gone to the uh, Culinary Institute of America. And he was a great inspiration to me. He um, he took me under his wing he showed me what excellence was all about that no plate went out of that kitchen unless it was absolutely perfect and having learned that at a a young age um, was really 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 important to me Uh, and the other thing that I learned there was that um, whether you're in a a leadership role or not always assume you are Uh, that was always Dean's way of doing things he didn't have the title of chef at the time Mm -hmm. 
He didn't even have the title of sous chef, but he assumed the role of it. He took the responsibility for it and really uh, taught all this, all of us to do that individually in that kitchen. And that's so huge to have that kind of mentoring early on and uh, to do that. Uh, Talk about the, the, the challenges along the way for you. What, what uh, from, from those beginnings, what were some of the challenges that you faced and how did you overcome those? Yes, uh, lots of challenges in the restaurant business. Um, probably the, uh, the biggest decision in my life, my wife and I were married in uh, 1988. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be celebrating our uh, 30 year anniversary this yes. year uh, in November. Very blessed about that. And uh, we found ourselves in Aspen, Colorado as a young married couple. Um, I was a chef of a hotel there called the Little Nell Hotel. It was really, really beautiful, exclusive. We had all the entertainers and uh, all the uh, TV stars coming through Aspen. And there was a lot of pressure. It was a small hotel, but uh, everything had to be perfect. There was a lot of hours. You worked every Christmas, every New Year's. And our daughter was born there. Lisa and I were faced with the decision, do we continue in our career or do we take the chance to open our own place and, uh, and therefore be able to make the decisions ourselves on when we open, when we close, when, when we have family time. And that was probably the hardest and most important decision that we made in our careers. And, um, and 25 years later, it turned out pretty good. Do you have an entrepreneurial bent to you? Did that feed that, or was that really a big step of faith for you? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, as a chef, everyone dreams of having their own restaurant, and, uh, and it's just not easy. It's a, it's a really demanding job. Uh, it requires a lot of startup capital, and, um, and so you really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very complicated. We opened, uh, so the steakhouse just turned uh, 25 years old. We opened our fish market grill, uh, 17 year, years ago, three weeks before 9-11. Wow. Probably the second uh, biggest challenge of my life was, uh, was dealing with that because, you know, we all faced uh, a really, really difficult financial time. Uh, all the airfare, all the air uh, flights shut down. Uh, nobody was eating out. Everybody was in shock. I had borrowed $800,000 to open this uh, seafood restaurant, and I'm three weeks into it. I'm thinking... We're in big trouble here. <laughs> and uh, so we pulled together. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, we, uh, we ran a special. Uh, we had a little money left over. We took out a billboard on the tollway, and it, all the billboard said was, all you could eat lobster, Chamberlain's Fish Market <laughs> Grill. <laughs> now, let me tell you, they came out of the woodworks. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, it was pretty neat. But uh, we've, uh, we've survived some very difficult times, but uh, we've also been blessed with a lot of great years. Yeah. Richard, one of the things that just blows my mind right now, first of all, our Metroplex is just booming, uh, and there's restaurants just popping up on every corner, new concepts and all these neat things that different people are doing, but they seem to uh, disappear as fast as they come up. So here you are 25 years in. Um, you know, the steakhouse uh, has been the staple of Addison, which, you know, per capita is one of the busiest restaurant spots in the whole United States. So, you know, I guess for me, it comes down, what's the secret sauce? What, what are you doing that is different than everybody else to be able to uh, withstand different economies and different markets and um, amongst so many other restaurant owners? Well, I, I really wish I could take the credit, but <clears throat> I can only take a very, very small part of the credit. Uh, I'm surrounded with great, great people. Uh, you know, Jeff Barker, my partner of uh, 23 years, um, our CFO, Cheryl Kirshner, uh, Land Nickens, who's the chef at the steakhouse for the last 18 years. Um, uh, Valentin at our fish market. He's actually second generation to our restaurant. His, start, his father started with us uh, 24 years ago at our steakhouse, and he was the uh, primary steak chef, uh, cooked most of the steaks for many years. Uh, his son started working for us while he was in high school and learned everything he needed to know about running a kitchen at the fish market grill and uh, was promoted to the chef position about seven years ago. So we're into second generation employees. And that's, <clears throat> that to me is the difference in, um, in, in really maintaining a consistent product for many, many years. Uh, the other secret is just buying the best products that you can. So great quality products, retain good quality 
great quality employees, uh, and then treat people really nicely. Treat people like you're having a dinner party in your house every night. That's the key. I was I was reading a, a kind of a follow up to that uh, an article that was written kind of about your secret for hiring uh, people and talk a little bit about that because you know I know for a lot of business owners uh, making the right hire is a make or break decision right yes and so uh, you've been very good at, at creating this family environment so talk a little bit about how you do that what what are the things that you're looking for in people uh, that has created this family atmosphere at Chamberlain's sure yeah many years ago when I worked at the Little Nell Hotel uh, Danny Meyer a very uh, famous restaurant tour at uh, New York who has like Gramercy Tavern and Union Square Cafe uh, he wrote a book about uh, his Union Square Cafe and their process of hiring because you know New York was always known as like the worst service in the world People could be rude to you. They didn't care. You know, you just went up. You kind of endured it as a New Yorker. But he, you know, he said to himself, well, why do we have to have grumpy people serving our food? Why don't we take young people with no experience who have really, really happy uh, wanting to serve attitudes and train them to be servers? Let's start them from scratch so that they've never had uh, any, you know, any, any bad kind of thought in their mind about the service industry. And, and so really we took that approach. It, was, uh, it wasn't about the experience you had, it was about the attitude that you had towards serving guests. And if you were friendly and really had a desire to serve, then you were right for our restaurant. We'll train you to do the rest. Yeah. So Richard, as you progress through your career uh, as a chef leading a kitchen and then transitioning into the role of restaurateur, entrepreneur, uh, what did you learn uh, from running a kitchen that's helped you as a restaurateur? And what are one or two things that you needed to learn in order to be a, a, a successful restaurateur? Yes, yeah, so many things. Uh, Gus Casigris, uh, uh, one of the professors down at El Centro College when I attended there, um, he really drilled into our minds that cost control was a key. Uh, coming from a Greek restaurant family background, <laughs> uh, he knew cost control. Sure. And so he really taught us to, you know, really, you know, buy good quality products, give nice portion sizes, but really control all the costs that you can. Save those pennies because margins in restaurants are very, very small. So he really uh, gave me the framework of uh, that thought. To, uh, and I, I practiced that throughout my career. And then later getting into the restaurant, there were, there were many things that I had to learn from, you know, uh, real estate rent to uh, insurance uh, situations, um, uh, various uh, uh, accounting functions that I didn't really have a full grasp of early on. Mm -hmm. But again, you surround yourself with really, really great people, and uh, and you know they can really help you along with that those types of things. And then uh, probably one of the most important things that I did was uh, firing myself from the kitchen. Okay. Uh, I realized early on that uh, there's a lot of different functions that uh, a chef and owner has to do. And you just, as much as you want to be on the line and cooking every dish and, you know, helping with every dish, you can still be in the kitchen. You can still see all that. Uh, but as a chef owner, you have to have the flexibility to be in the dining room, watch things and, uh, and be able to just, you know, be everywhere. And uh, so firing myself was really key. Yeah. That's hard to do. Hard to do. As a chef, every chef's dream is to, is to help prepare every plate. We want to we wanna see every process of every plate uh, because, you know, that's really what we do. That's, that's what we love to do, uh, making sure that everything's perfect. And, uh, and so I would encourage uh, young chef restaurateurs that, that want to have their own restaurant to really understand that you can be in the kitchen you can see what's going on. You can see most of the plates go out, but give that control over to other people so that you can really have the flexibility to visit with your guests, to find out what their needs are, to really grow your business that way. So at the end of the day, I mean, it, it comes back to the old relationship thing. I mean, people uh, uh, absolutely grasp onto and, and um, you know, and find themselves coming back to the places where they feel valued, right? And where they have relationships. So. Yes. Uh, you know, it's it's much more fun, and, and I was a I was a super shy guy growing up, uh, and and so Dean Faring was the first one that uh, encouraged me to go into the restaurant on his night off to say hi to guests, and they literally, literally had to drag me into the <laughs> restaurant to do that. I was really I, I was very much a, kind of an introvert shy guy. I loved cooking, 
but to go out and talk to people who I felt were intimidating was very, very difficult for me. But I realized along the way, <laughs> funny story, when I was working at the Bel Air Hotel in Los Angeles, the chef there, uh, Joe Veniza, he said, hey, look, I know you don't like to go to the dining room, but um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he's one of our best regulars. You need to go out. Just say hi to him. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I go out there, and uh, I was so scared. I was so <laughs> scared. I was, you know, 23 years old, and here I am in the – this dining room of a nice restaurant and going to talk to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar with the Lakers. And uh, I walk out there and uh, I said, Mr. Jabbar, uh, I'm Richard Chamberlain. I'm the sous chef. I, and, you know, I just want to make sure everything's okay. And his business manager turned to me and he goes, do you mind? We're trying to have a conversation here. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I went back to Joe. I said, Joe, I am never doing that again. But uh, And then you know, how, many, how many more years did it take you to want to go back out I in the know. dining room? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, but, uh, you know, um, what, you, what you find out as a young chef is eventually is that um, people really want to know what you're doing in the kitchen. And so um, when you find out that uh, you keep the conversation really about food – uh, find out about them, what their needs are, and uh, just about them as people. Uh, it becomes really fun after that. So mm -hmm. that's what I focused on. So you had to grow into that relational, out, a little bit more outgoing, reaching out to the customer side of that? Oh, oh, it was painful. It was so <laughs> painful, you know. And, and then getting into uh, doing TV and radio, oh, my gosh. Uh, it, it's, you know, talk about really tough. You know, it's uh, – I, 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 you know, I try to teach our uh, our younger chefs coming up uh, about really how to organize yourself for a TV or a radio show because, um, you know, it's there's a lot of things that can go wrong really quickly, especially, you know, you're doing a TV show and you've got a three and a half minute segment. And boy, if you don't have a dish ready at the end of that three and a half minutes, it's not a pretty deal because they're <laughs> they're cutting away. They're going away. You're about a quarter of the way through your dish. So, uh so, yeah, there's a lot of things to learn as a young chef. Yeah. I, I always admire people who push themselves beyond their comfort zone and, and, and really do what it needs to be done to build a business or to, to grow. Because so, so there are times if you just stay in that little comfort zone, it, you'll, you'll never bust through and achieve what, what, what we could possibly achieve. So. Well, it's absolutely true. Uh, I, got into con uh, I started doing some consulting work in the mid-2000s. It took me to uh, back to Aspen to help them reopen their hotel at the Little Nell. Uh, I helped open a restaurant in Las, uh, Las Vegas, and uh, I did one in Telluride, and I also did a cookbook tour for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association that took me into probably 35 states over the course of two years doing radio and TV, including the USA Today show in New York uh, several times, um, which required a lot of media training, a lot of, um, just a lot of learning about it. And uh, again, as a, as a not is not a, a natural uh, speaker. Uh, it, it was a real challenge for me to, uh, you know, to do it. But boy, you know, I agree with you. You know, pushing yourself to do stuff that you're not comfortable with, man, that's what life is all about because yeah. you just don't know what's out there. Yeah. It's, it's crazy to me too because, I mean, going to Richard's restaurants uh, since I was little, um, I've never seen that side of you, this, you know, I, you know, introverted side i've always known this richard and so for me it it, it absolutely is uh is amazing to see where you are and also uh, uh i admire the fact that you broke through that comfort zone because you are a natural i mean this you you have fun with this and so it's, it's pretty cool for sure having fun is the key for yeah. sure and if you do something long enough uh, you know that season of life starts shifting on you and you find yourself being the one who's mentoring younger guys right yes and, and so uh, i'm assuming that that's part of your journey these days it's pretty fulfilling and and so when you're doing that what are the things that you're finding yourself really passing on to the next generation of chefs yes i love uh, i love it when i get an email or a call or if a guest in my restaurant says hey listen i have a son or i have a nephew uh, or or somebody who is thinking about a career in either uh, the culinary arts or the restaurant business because i want to talk to that person i want to i want to get to know them get to know their personality first uh, to find out really if if it's a good fit and then, and then try to help them uh, brainstorm, you know, what, what part of the industry would be best for them. Uh, and I'm not an expert, but I, I read people pretty well now, having worked with a lot of people. And um, I just like to let them know um, 
what path is best for them and how to get there. And so, uh, you know, I would encourage anybody who uh, has um, either children or people they know, friends of the family that are thinking about this career, uh, get a hold of me, get a hold of one of the other uh, uh, leading chef restaurateurs in town and uh, just ask them for a little time because uh, it, it really saves you uh, a lot of money. You know, I, I talk to people who say, hey, my kid, you know, just graduated. He just got a four-year degree from, a, you know, a, a liberal arts degree, and now he wants to go to culinary school for two years up in culinary, you know, at the CIA. It's going to cost another, uh, you know, $150,000. Uh, should Gosh. he do that? Well, I need to talk to that kid <laughs> make <laughs> right. sure that 150000 is uh, really what he wants to do. And usually that translates back to, uh, you know, hey, go get a got job in a restaurant first. Yeah. Find out if you love it. Now, and, then, uh, and then proceed from there. Mm -hmm. Richard, your son, junior or senior at SMU? You know, he just graduated. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, <laughs> he just graduated from uh, SMU uh, this past May and uh, right on time. Uh, which was very, very important Amen. to me and my wife. And uh, he just uh, started a great new job down in uh, Austin. He's in his fourth week of his new job. Talk to him almost every day. And, uh, you know, just love hearing the, the successes, the little successes and the challenges and, and all those things. But uh, it's real exciting. Then we have a daughter, of course, that's uh, 27. She got married uh, several years ago as a first grade school teacher down in Dripping Springs outside of Austin. And uh, uh, her husband is in the oil business down there. We're really blessed with an incredible family and uh, probably going to be opening a restaurant in Austin pretty soon, given right. that both our kids are there. <laughs> I, I'm curious on that. You know, uh, a dad of, of, of two kiddos and this, we have such an interesting culture today. I mean, things have changed dramatically with just access to information and the way that uh, it seems that kids process information, you know, what are the one or two or three things that uh, you've shared with your kids is that this is the things that you need to do to be successful in life? What, what, what are, what are the, the, I guess you could say the best things that dad has said to them that uh, really could set them up for success in their life? Well, um, we, you know, we always taught, uh, number one, uh, humbleness, you know, really being humble in everything that you do, I think is really key. Uh, working really, really hard at anything that you set your mind to. And, um, you know, again, the training that I didn't have early on was, um, you know, was uh, how to win friends and, uh, you know, meet people and things like that. So I try to introduce books early on when they were in uh, high school, primarily uh, for summer reading. And I would pay them to read important uh, leadership books and, and important self-developing books. And uh, they would do it begrudgingly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, you you know, you hang a new phone out there and, you know, they'll do just about anything you want them to do. <laughs> nice. And, uh, you know, Tori uh, was just talking about how important that book was her the other, uh, the other day and that she had actually got it uh, out. And she actually did a podcast on teaching this past week. I listened to it on the, in the morning this morning on the way here. And, uh, oh, my gosh, you know. Uh, just really, really great to, to see your kids uh, continuing a, a legacy in their own careers uh, and uh, just uh, really doing great. Let's talk a little bit about your uh, reasons for being such a philanthropic business leader. Uh, we at ISF are blessed because we have a gala every fall, and uh, for the past several years, it's been the Taste of Chamberlain's uh, ISF gala. This is our 10th anniversary coming up on October 13th, and once again, we can just uh, just add the value that you bring to us as a foundation and a charity that works with foster care kids. And we're just one of many uh, uh, who are, are blessed by you. So talk a little bit about why you do that, what, why, what's important about philanthropy to you and, and, and the whole giving back to the community that you do. It's amazing. Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me just say that um, my mother uh, was the first one to say it, and the Lord gave me a gift. It was a, it was a gift of cooking. And um, I am blessed because uh, there are many opportunities to use that gift uh, to help others. Uh, the, being a chef, being in, involved in restaurants uh, allows you the opportunity to um, involve yourself with you know, many, many uh, different fundraising organizations, ISF being a very important one, um, and to help others. Um, I grew up 
you know, in a very, very difficult young situation uh, as a youngster uh, with uh, just a very challenging, uh, lots of challenges as a, as a young child, um, not having enough money, at times not having enough food. Uh, and so when you're, you know, when you, when you get into a situation uh, later in life where you look back and you, you can see how really God has directed and helped you in so many ways, uh, there's just no question that you want to do his work and giving back. And so really that's my motivation. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, as we wrap it up, what, what, uh, you know, somebody's wanting to know where to go to dinner tonight. Uh, what's the what's the value proposition that, that just uh, makes the the experience at one of your Chamberlain restaurants so special? Well, uh, again, I think it's number one uh, the people. I, I think when you walk in and and the uh, the valet Parker shakes your hand and says welcome to Chamberlain's, and when you get to the uh, to the host stand. And one of our general managers or a, or a hostess or a host uh, greets you with welcome to Chamberlain's and then the bartender does the same thing and the server does the same thing. You're feeling pretty welcome by the time you sit down. And, <laughs> and really, uh, that's that's really our mission is to make people feel very, very welcome and to humbly serve them uh, and to, you know, buy the best products to, to put on the table. But uh, it's really just about making people feel special every night. Well, we love coming to your, your place, and it is that. It, it, it is that feel of coming into your home, and, and you welcome us and, and serve us so well. Uh, as, as leaders uh, on our journey and your journey, uh, there's a lot of input we've had with regards to things we've read, and, and uh, we like to ask our guests, what, what, what have you read in, in your journey with regards to leadership that has been uh, the most impactful and, and the, the takeaways that you've gotten from, from, from that particular favorite leadership book? Well, most of my books were uh, service oriented because, uh, you know, we're, we're in the service industry. And so Marriott wrote a book many years ago that uh, that really talked about how to go above and beyond what the service expectations all are. And, and I'll also say that uh, Zig Ziglar was a, a really inspiring yeah. uh, person to me in that regard, attending uh, his classes at Prestonwood Baptist Church for many years. Um, but it really, uh, you know, in the service industry, we try to separate ourselves uh, from uh, everybody else uh, in our categories. And it's really by going above and beyond what's expected. And for example, um, during our early days at the restaurant, uh, I gave a speech on, um, you know, let's, let's do something tonight. Everybody do something tonight that is above and beyond what the guest expects, anything. And uh, so one waiter took it really to heart, and uh, some people were thinking about going to a movie. And this is back before there were iPhones, and you could look it up. And so uh, he decided he was going to send a manager down the street to get a newspaper uh, because some guests were contemplating going to a movie, but they didn't know it was showing. And so when, when the manager came back and the, and the server presented this newspaper to him, and they could, you know, see, uh, make these, uh, you know, those choices on their movies – that was way above yeah. what any other competitor would have done that night. And so we learned early on that doing those little things creates customers for life. Absolutely. That's rich stuff. Well, thank you, Richard, for being with us. It's been a great podcast, and uh, we're, we're uh, so grateful for, um, for your being here. Congratulations again on the 25th anniversary. Uh, it's a thank big you. milestone for, for you all, and also uh, for your partnership with ISF. We, we appreciate all you do for us. Thank you. Well, ISF is really, really dear to my heart, uh, helping um, – uh, young children that are facing very difficult situations and uh, helping them uh, to get uh, educated and, and to be successful in life is, uh, is a great cause. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, Tyler, I'm going to send it back to you because you launched a little trivia question, and I'm sure our guests or our listeners are excited about uh, who is this guy, who is this leader? Yeah, we, we're, uh, we're following along with that football theme as we, as we approach uh, football season. Uh, as a Cowboys fan, i got to tell you, this one is a little bit hard. Uh, but uh, we all remember uh, uh, the tragedy of Hurricane Harvey uh, was the, one of the costliest uh, natural tragedies uh, uh, that, that we've faced in the state of Texas. Over $125 billion worth of damage uh, uh, that caused from beginning to end uh, as it roared through uh, the ocean and up uh, through the Gulf. Um, but uh, this particular guy uh, absolutely uh, took it upon himself to, to make a huge difference. 
uh, and is somebody that we would definitely call a living legend. He set a goal uh, to raise two hundred thousand dollars, and in thirty-seven, uh, uh, or excuse me, in, in just under a week, he raised thirty-seven million dollars from two hundred thousand donors. Uh, and so uh, J.J. Watt, uh, an unbelievable football player, defensive player of the year last year, uh, truly is a living legend. Mm-hmm. And uh, his influence really helped uh, reshape the lives of so many uh, down in Houston. So that's what our show's about, uh, is to wow. feature those types of people. And uh, he didn't have to do that, uh, but just his influence made such a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Great story. Great mm-hmm. story. Thank you. Well, folks, that's a wrap uh, for our podcast today in behalf of Jason Smith and Tyler Tallman and our special guest, Richard Chamberlain. This is Blair Ritchie wishing you a a great day today. And uh, just want to remember the words of John Quincy Adams, who once wrote, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, then you are a leader. Legends in Leadership is brought to you by ISF and Carrington Group. ISF is committed to leadership development for aged out foster care and orphan youth. ISF's mission is to transform these youth into tomorrow's leaders with scholarships, mentoring and leadership training. Google International Student Foundation to learn more. Carrington Group is a family office with a passion for helping business leaders and their families make smart choices and fulfill their highest aspirations. Google Carrington Group Dallas, Texas to learn more. Securities offered through Regulus Advisors, LLC. Member FINRA slash SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Regal Investment Advisors, LLC, and SEC Registered Investment Advisor. Regulus Advisors and Regal Investment Advisors are affiliated entities. Carrington Group and this broadcast are independent of Regulus Advisors and Regal Investment Advisors.